Guys, this is the last subtopic of topic four. It's robots and automated production. So with robots, what we're doing is we are seeing that there's a benefit of increased efficiency and consistency, okay, which is good, right, uh, especially if you want that. Um, if you want something that is unique and one of a kind, then a robot is not going to make that for you. Right? Uh, robots are more efficient. They don't need to take breaks. They don't need to go to sleep. They don't need to go to the bathroom. They don't need to take their kids to the dentist. So they are more efficient that way. And again, they're just more consistent than humans. Once you program a robot to do something, it's going to do the exact same thing every time. Automation of, um, of production, though, that impacts people's jobs. Right? And we're going to talk a little bit more about that down here. But um, we have an ethical and moral responsibility to consider that when we're implementing automated um, production. And so automated production, it reduces the need for skilled workers. So if you, you know, look into the past um, when you wanted to have something made, um, you know, especially in a production line, you would have people who were, who were quite skilled and took many years to learn their, their craft, to learn what they were doing. And those usually when you have to learn something for many years, you are highly paid. So a skilled worker is going to be a high paid worker and robots are taking over those jobs because they're routine. Robots basically take over routine type jobs. If it's something that is just you're doing the same thing every time, that is something that a robot can definitely take over. However, um, what you are doing is creating new jobs and some of those new jobs are things like programmers, people who program the robots designers, people who design the robots, and technicians who maintain the robots. Now this is called creative destruction. So you are kind of destroying an old way of life or an old um, job and, and adding new ones. The problem is, is that skilled workers, there were more skilled workers than there are people who program design and are technicians. And so you're losing a lot of high paying jobs in this process. Now this is a good and bad thing. You know, um, another example of uh, creative destruction was the switch from um, cottage industry to, um, to the Industrial Revolution, where things are made in factories. You know, in cottage, cottage industries, like if you wanted a pair of shoes, you would go to a cobbler and he would make the shoes from start to finish. And, you know, that, that meant that he was very skilled and shoes were very expensive. When shoes started being made in factories, they then started to be cheaper, which is good, but you would have unskilled people making certain parts of the shoes. So somebody would make you know, the sole of the shoe, somebody would make the heel of the shoe, somebody would make the uppers of the shoe. So they would, they would have different people doing different jobs and those tended to be less skilled and therefore lower paying. So you destroyed one industry and you created another industry and there are benefits and, and, and uh, costs to that process. Okay, so we need to consider those things as we look at uh, the transition from, from people doing jobs to robots doing jobs. All right, um, what we're looking at here is the definition of an industrial robot. So this is something that is automatically controlled, it's reprogrammable, it's multi-purpose, it can manipulate, it manipulates things, um, and it manipulates those things in three or more axes. Um, this can either be fixed or mobile, and you're going to use it industrial for industrial purposes, right? Have a look at this video. It's like 20 minutes long, so I don't expect you to, to watch the whole thing. Just kind of like, like scroll through the whole thing just to, to get an idea of the different applications of industrial robots. And if you really do like this sort of thing, like I did watch the whole thing because um, I like this sort of thing, um, you can watch the whole thing. All right. A couple of definitions that we need to know are work envelope. So the work envelope is the fixed 3D space where work activities take place. Okay, so this would be the work envelope of this robot, this whole thing right here. It's uh, greater than 180 degrees in the, I suppose this would be the, the Y axis. Um, in the X axis, this robot can move, you know, greater than 180 degrees. Now, when you have an operating envelope, so that would be the, the area where the where the robot is operating. And so that would be this black area. And that would mean that humans really shouldn't go into this restricted envelope. So if you were working with this machine, it would mean that you should really just stay out of this area right here, this, this grayed out area. 
Load capacity is important to consider when we're, we're uh, looking at robots. So this is you know, the weight that a robot can manipulate. The bigger the robot, generally the greater the weight. Smaller the robot, smaller the weight. We'll look at some types of robots. So the first type of robot that we're going to look at is industrial robots. So this is an example of an industrial robot. Uh, it's, you know, we've, we've, I'm not going to spend too much time on this because we've talked about this before, but they are um, doing a lot of the, um, the jobs that people used to do in production lines. This is a growing segment of the market. These are service robots. So for something like you know, your Roomba, a Roomba is a service robot. Uh, it's there to serve you. Um, this is an interesting type of robot that you see increasingly. So, for instance, if there's a, a fire in a building, in the old days, a fireman would want to go into that building to check if there was anybody still in there um, so that they don't burn to death or die of smoke inhalation or something like that. Nowadays, what you would do is you would send a robot in to do that, and that robot would then look for people. If there's somebody in there, fireman goes in to save that person. If there's nobody in there, then you haven't put that fireman in, in uh, life in danger by sending them into a burning building. So service robots are an increasing segment of our um, of the robotics market. We have personal care robots. So these are robots that are there as caregivers. So they're not really nurses, but what they are doing is if somebody's disabled, the robot could get them, say, for instance, a bottle of water or make them, you know, bring them food or whatever. They could, it could assist them in their personal needs rather than a human doing that. We have medical robots. So these are uh, robots that I would say within your lifetime are going to start to replace routine surgeries and things like that. I don't think you'll, you'll lose surgeons uh, who do really specialized surgery, but you know, anything routine will start to be more and more taken care of by, by a robot. So for instance, let's say you wanted to get a, a mole removed because it was looking you know, precancerous. Well, maybe a, a robot would do that rather than a surgeon. Okay, another kind of group are single task, and we'll look at multiple tasks in a second. So single task robots, these are robots that carry out one task. So your Roomba is there to vacuum your floor. It might entertain your cat, but it is not that that is not its primary purpose. Its primary purpose is to vacuum your floor. Okay, so we have multiple task robots, and, and you saw an example of this when we looked at uh, systems of production in the last topic. So you know, this is something that can carry out multiple tasks. So this is a robot like the one that you saw that, that can do multiple tasks. Now, this is an interesting category. It's called machine to machine. Okay, and this is basically where machines communicate with other machines or between similar devices. Okay, and that's either wired or wireless. And a, a great example of this would be a smart refrigerator. So in, in the future, what you would do is you would have a refrigerator. It would sense that you're low on milk, and then it would contact the store and buy you more milk, which would then be shipped to your house um, all automatically. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't be involved in there at all. And it's communicating with, with a, a robot at the store. And that robot might be an artificial intelligence. Okay, So th this is an interesting thing. When we talk about robots, we're not robots. We're not simply talking about physical things. It can also be something with uh, artificial intelligence. First generation robots, these were simple mechanical arms and they had precise movements and did it at high speed. But this is the key thing for this definition. They needed constant human supervision. Okay, so that's an important idea. Because when we look at a second generation robot, these are equipped with sensors and they can provide Im information about their surroundings. They can synchronize with each other, but they do not require constant human supervision. Okay, they're controlled by an external control unit. And this is an example of a second generation robot. This is a robot that is a cleaner robot. It's basically sweeping the floor at an airport in Korea. And it can sense its environment, so it can avoid, for instance, people, but it can also, um, it, it doesn't need to be supervised by a human. And it can synchronize with the other cleaner robots within the, the airport um, so that it, it can, they can all do their job. Okay, we talk about third generation robots. So these are autonomous and they largely operate without human supervision. Um, they have their own central control units and sometimes you'll see these as swarms of smaller autonomous robots that fit into this category, right? But an example of this would be like the Mars rover, rovers. It takes, you know, I forget what the, the time is, but it, I think it takes like 20 minutes for a signal to go from Mars to Earth. Um, and then 
replying to that would take another 20 minutes. So, you know, if this robot sent a signal to its controller on Earth, then the controller would, you know, receive that, that message 20 minutes later and then have to send a message back. So the whole thing would take 40 minutes for this to get its, its information. And by that time, this could have driven off of a cliff. So it needs to be autonomous. It needs to basically make decisions without the supervision from a human. Okay? Now, humans do control them and do send up new programs to it. But you know, for the most part, they can operate without any human um, doing anything. Okay, and they have their own central control unit within the actual robot itself. Okay, so that's a good example of a third generation robot. Okay, artificial intelligence. So these are machines or computers that mimic the cognitive functions that humans associate with our minds, with human minds. Okay, and that's learning and problem solving. And so, you know, things like recognizing a, a person. This is actually very difficult, believe it or not, and especially things like facial recognition, very difficult. Um, you know, it's something that we find super easy because we're humans, and this is uh, something that we, we do really well. In fact, there's something called pareidolia, where, you know, you see um, a face in things, like, you know, the front of a car might look like a face because it's got, you know, the... The headlights look like eyes, and the grill of it looks like a mouth, and you know it's got a little icon on it, so on the hood, so it looks like a nose. You know that that kind of thing for us, we recognize that as a face, but a, a computer wouldn't. So these are these are you know artificial intelligence is mimicking that ability, and it's getting better and better and better at it. Um, and so this is the kind of thing that's going to actually start to replace uh, certain jobs that were. You know, up until now, something that we associated only with humans, having some sort of cognitive function. Okay, so that, that's that's really an interesting type of robotics. I know it doesn't seem like a robot, but artificial intelligence is an automated production, right? Um, things like your general practitioner doctor are, you know, within your lifetime, I think, going to be replaced by artificial intelligence. Okay, uh, something that a you know, a computer can actually access a much greater database than a human being. Right? Our, hum our database is our brain, uh, and then we'd have to go look at books and things like that. A computer can do that faster, quicker, and more efficiently. And it's actually been proven that some of these artificial doctors um, can diagnose uh, diseases much better than a human. So imagine within your lifetime you're going to see things like general practitioner doctors disappearing as a job. So if you are going to become a doctor, Make sure that you specialize. And that leads me to this idea. So one of the things that, that's sort of being kicked around in a lot of places right now is something called Universal Basic Income, which is UBI. And this is a government program that would peer, give periodic payments uh, to individuals without a means test or work requirement. In other words, a means test would be like, you know, if, if you have, you're, you're making, I don't know, a million dollars a year, you would still get this universal basic income. If you're making, you know, ten thousand dollars a year, you would get this universal basic income. A, a means test means that you you um, look at how much somebody makes, um, and then work requirements are that you know do do you have to work for this money? So this is something that's that's very interesting. Um, basically, it's giving money to people so that they can take care of their basic needs, and it might mean that they can do things more that they would like to do. If, if artificial intelligence and automated um, production and robotics takes over a lot of the, the sort of tasks that we normally would, would do, well, what do we do, right? How do we make money? If all of those jobs are gone, you need to be able to give people money so that they can still buy the things that they need. And so one idea is this idea of universal basic income. Yeah, have a quick look at this video. It's, it's only four minutes long, uh, but it gives you a good idea of what universal basic income is and some of the problems associated with it. You know, like what's the motivation to work if somebody's just giving you money? Um, now, you know, when we're talking about universal basic income, we're talking about, you know, relatively small amounts of money for an individual. It's not enough to generally live on, but it would help to support you uh, so that you could do what you wanted to do rather than um, having to, I don't know, have multiple jobs, let's say. So have a look at this and, um, and 
kind of think about what you think about universal basic income. All right, thanks for watching, guys.